Welcome to the Wilderness Season Podcast. I'm your host, Sherry Ward. I have a passion to bring hope and breakthrough to those experiencing the toughest times of their lives. In this podcast, we will give you critical insights and revelations as I interview people just like you, those who have been right where you are and understand exactly what a wilderness season is all about. It's real, it's raw, it's practical. Come join the conversation. Welcome to the Wilderness Season Podcast. Hello and welcome to the Wilderness Season Podcast. I'm your host, Sherry Ward, and with me today is Trevor Duffy. He's a really good friend of mine and a good, a new dad, huh? Yeah. Yep. Two weeks. Two weeks. Oh my gosh. And you're still standing. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> he's uh, pretty tired. <laughs> he's a blessing. No, my our second son was he's been super super easy compared to our little boy Axel. He's a blast, but he has a lot of energy. Oh, so what's the, his name? Forbes. Yep. Forbes. All right. Forbes. Rich. Rich. <laughs> yeah, wealth. That's what the that's what we felt like he was going to be captivating oh. in his life as wealth, so we just named him wow. Forbes. That's so cool. I love mm-hmm. that. Yeah. And you have an amazing story about being in the wilderness. So you want to tell us a little bit about your wilderness experience and what landed you in the wilderness? Yeah. I I think uh it's kind of interesting cuz when people ask me about my wilderness season it's like the first 20 years of my life I would consider the wilderness season like I don't really know a time that I wasn't in it. You know what I mean? Yeah. So Yeah. And I can explain that a little bit better but you know, I, it started when I was you know, probably four, four years old, I think I was, four and a half. Mm-hmm. And uh, I was sexually assaulted as a young boy for about seven months straight, every day for about seven months mm-hmm. straight. Um, and at my babysitter's house. So essentially, I lived in a really small town uh, in, in Oregon. And you know, you trusted everybody because we knew everybody, right? Or like, right, right. like my my great great grandparents actually settled the town, so it was like I was either related to them or my parents or myself grew up with these people, right? So right. it was it was a very safe environment. Um, and then, you know, this this babysitter I had, she was a great older lady. Uh, she was fantastic i still you know talk to her to this day she's she's a great woman in in general um but she had a a nephew that at the time i didn't know was going through some pretty crazy things himself Mm -hmm. and and he went and he came and stayed with her for a while because come to know now his dad and his mom were on trial for sexual molestation of children um like seven or eight different children Wow. Um, and three of them being him and his two brothers. So it was, uh, it was interesting to say the least, you know, it, it was, like I said, it lasted about five months and, and at the time I didn't know what it was, right? Like I was four, yeah. You're I, was little. Very, I was very innocent, very little. Uh, yeah. and you know, now that I look back on it, it, it affected my life even up to this day. You know, and not not just the the trauma of it, but I was molested alongside a, a little girl as well, my same age. Mm-hmm. And I think the impact of that, you know, was almost more detrimental than just the act itself. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, yeah. And I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, in a little bit. But anyway, so, you know, it started pretty safe. Uh, the guy, I won't go into too much detail, but it started as, you know, a slip up here, a slip up there. So it was more him kind of getting comfortable with us and stuff. And, and then it came to a point where I remember, you know, I kind of realized and I noticed that it was, it was wrong, you know? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so I confronted him and, and, you know, what a, a four-year-old can confront as is, Hey, right. you know, if you don't stop, I'm going to tell somebody, you know? Right. And I remember he looked at me and he was, I think 16 at the time, 15, 16. Mm -hmm. And he looked at me and he said, like, if you tell anyone, I'm going to kill this little girl, you know? Oh, that's tough. And so it trapped me because I was like, 
is he serious? You know, could he do this? You know, is this something that could, could, could be a real thing? And, and so my wilderness season started in this environment of, of my heart being eaten, you know, torn apart because I'm, I know that something's happening that's wrong, but I was afraid for this girl's life at the same time. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, this happened for about four and a half months every day. And, and my parents kind of could see it. I was starting to act out at home, you know, frustrated. I wasn't sleeping very well because I had, you know, I stayed awake, you know, with the shame and the, what I know now to be shame where I just laid there right. and it was just like, man, how can I help this little girl? Like I wasn't even worried about me. I was worried about her, you know? Right. And you know, when something's introduced to you at such a young age, that's, that's, you know, they took, that's perverted, right? It's like they took, he's took something and that should be amazing. That should be a blessing, you know, s- sex in general. Mm-hmm. Um, and he perverted it to where it took my innocence away. Right. Because everything that I saw, the interactions I had were all negative on part around this. Mm-hmm. And, you know, so after, you know, he left for about a month to go and do the trial things to testify, all that kind of stuff, mm-hmm. uh, and his parents trial and his, his uncle's trial. And, you know, it stopped. And so I was like, oh, you know, like it kind of gave me a break. Cause I was like, oh, like, like it's done. Like I can, I can move on. And then he came back. Wow. And at that time, I remember he came back and about two weeks into him, you know, it escalated, you know, it got worse. He started doing you know, worse things and stuff. But one day, you know, the, the babysitter, she came and she came to check on us. Cause she usually, she would, you know, leave in the morning time to make breakfast. It was a different part of the house. And then she would right. come back. And then, so she always had the same schedule. She was just, that's how she did it, you know? Mm-hmm. And one day she came and checked on us during lunchtime and, you know, he caught her and, and thank God for her, you know, it was, you know, her nephew, but, but, you know, she grabbed him and threw him out and, and slammed the door and called the cops and called my parents. And, and I think this is the point in my life where I realized that shame is a huge, huge negative, right? It's a thing that will keep people where they're at. Mm -hmm. And I remember my parents, I remember sitting in their, in her living room and there's big sliding glass doors. And I saw my dad pull up with my mom and, and my dad, you know, went in and he was, very frustrated. Uh, my dad was a very intense man, big man. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then, so I remember him, you know, going in and talking to, to, to the babysitter and, and, you know, the cops showed up and it was this whole, whole ordeal. My mom came in and she took me out to our truck. And I remember, you know, the only thing that I could say to her when I sat in there, I said, mom, I'm sorry. Mm-hmm. And she looked at me and she goes, you know, son, why are you sorry? I said, because I couldn't do anything to protect this girl. Oh, wow. And so even at, sorry, I still get emotional about this, but yeah, yeah. even at a young age, you know, I think it's kind of a, a man's inclination that he's a protector, right? Mm-hmm. And so at that young of an age, my identity was attacked in multiple ways mm-hmm. as a protector, as a, you know, as a friend to her you know, it attacked my identity, you know, it started this thing, uh, where I questioned my sexuality after that, you know, I got into pornography when I was young, about six years old, where mm-hmm. I was just, it kind of came to this point. Cause it's like, you know, what comes up when you, when you search on the internet, what's sex supposed to be like, you know, mm-hmm. or like, what, what is this interaction supposed to be? Is this something that's normal? Is this something that's, that's out there? And I came to find that, sadly this is normal right sadly you know children being molested happens a lot more than what people think you know Mm -hmm. and i realized Mm -hmm. that that it wasn't healthy obviously right but right right. but at such a young age it's like i was hiding i never told anybody about this none of my friends none of my family my brother didn't even know he read my book that i'm writing um about my life month and a half ago because i've kind of finally got it to a point where i'm kind of letting people read it and you know he just broke down crying he's like i didn't even i didn't even know this happened to you you know so it was like my 
my life was kind of sheltered between my parents and me. And we never talked about it after that, you know, and I never Mm -hmm. talked about anything with anybody after that. So I was really on my own at such a young age trying to figure it out. Right. And so, you know, pornography came in, you know, I even got to the point where I was like, man, am I, am I gay? You know, like, is gay a thing for me? Like, do Mm -hmm. I, is, is men interacting, you know, that, is that something that, that I'm into or whatever? And, and, you know, thank God that I lived in, in a city where that just wasn't a thing at the time, you right. know, cause it kind of prevented me from going that way. And, and cause I didn't have identity. Right. And right. so anyway, I kind of got into this, you know, it made me to where, you know, I lost my virginity when I was nine years old. And it's mm-hmm. like, like, that's not how it's supposed to be. Right. That's not how like that's young, you know, and that's, I didn't that realize, is very young. yeah. And I didn't realize what it was, you know, cause I was just like, I was just going through the motions and I was trying to fill this hole, this void in my heart of this mm-hmm. pain that I experienced, but I didn't even realize that that's what I was trying to do until a couple of years ago when I, you know, encountered Jesus. But, mm-hmm. you know, so I went through life at a young age, you know, started acting out a lot. I grew up in a home that was very abusive my father, he's an amazing man now. He was an amazing man then. He just had a lot of trauma and stuff that he had to deal with, and he has, and we have a great relationship now. But at the time, he was you know, very physically and emotionally abusive to my family, to me. And, you know, I uh, anger was pretty much the only emotion that I had at a young age, you know. Mm-hmm. And so... And shame. Yeah. And shame. Exactly. And shame, shame. Yeah. you know, anger and shame. And, and so it was nothing that was positive. It was, and, and, you know, I remember I was 10 years old and that was the first time that I, I used anger to defend myself against my father. You know, it's like my home's supposed to be a sanctuary. It's supposed to be a safe place. And, right. and at a young age, I'm having to, to fight my dad, you know, and it's like, what does a 10 year old do to a, a grown man? You know, nothing. Yeah. And, you know, so it's like, I'm trying to defend my family and within two seconds, I'm just, there's no use. Right. Right. And so that's another experience in my life where I just wasn't big enough, strong enough, fast enough, whatever, Mm. be protector of people that I love, you know? Right. Right. And so this kind of instilled a false identity in me where I'm never going to be a protector. I'm never going to be somebody that can protect people. And I'm not saying it's my job to protect everybody, but I mean, it's kind of something that men love to feel. They love to be providers and protectors and comforters. And, right. and right. at that age, I just didn't have that in my life, you know? And, and so I kind of took a hold of this anger emotion. You know, I took a hold of this, this fear emotion and I transported into anger and I really used anger at that time as a protective shield, right? As like a mm, covering where I, where I covered yeah. myself with it. And then as I got older and I got bigger and then I realized that I could use it as a weapon, right? Mm. I could shield when my father was, was aggressive. I could shield myself and I could shield people around me. But then also I knew that I could use it as a weapon that if I needed to, I could get angry in a second and my adrenaline would go through the roof and I could just create as much chaos and damage as I could in such a short amount of uh, time that, that whatever was going on, people would just be like, Whoa, like what's going on, you know? Yeah, yeah, it, yeah. Would, it would kind of make time stop, you know? Cause it was like, it was like a fiery ball that no one knew what to do with. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, but at that time I could, I only did it against people that I felt fear from that I felt, you know, weren't there for a good reason. And then were you still trying to find identity and like protecting those around you? I think at this point, not really. When I think back on it, I think at that point mm-hmm. I thought I was, but at mm-hmm. this point, really what it was is if you were on my side, you were protected just because I was protecting myself mm-hmm. because That's I'd right. never had anyone in my life protect me. Right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And So, you know, especially men, like if men at this time in my life were not a thing, like it just, if you weren't, 
Like I just didn't interact with men in a healthy way at all ever. I didn't care if you were my teacher, my principal, my parents, my cousins, my uncles. I just didn't interact in a good way. You know, it was just, I was always standoffish, always very disrespectful and rude. And, and, you know, so, but at this time, it's like, I didn't know this was a wilderness season. I didn't know that this was, right, was right. anything besides my life, you know? Right. Like, right. I thought this was my life. This is what my life was supposed to be. And then I, you know, about 14, 15, I took that anger and I really created like a sword out of it, where I really used it because I knew I could get people. I was very manipulative with it and I could mm-hmm. get people, you know, whenever I did something wrong. You know, my dad at this time, he was, you know, starting to work on himself and, you know, going to, he put himself through, you know, anger management. And like, I have so much respect mm-hmm. for my dad, how much work he did. And yeah. especially in that day and age. Yeah. Well, that's the thing is like mental health, even to this day, mental health and like these kinds of things isn't a thing there. Like I talk about it with my parents and they're just mm-hmm. like, like they're smart. Like, I don't want to say smarter, but they're kind of more inclined to this kind of stuff now because i've been going through a lot of it the last few years and my wife she's really amazing at you know helping people with mental health and stuff and she's really you know the reason why i kind of started getting into it but anyway you know so at that time that's a huge thing for someone for a grown man that's lived 50 years of his life as a very aggressive abusive man to realize oh wow like i'm gonna lose my family i'm gonna lose my life right And so I knew that if I could get him riled up, then I would take, I could take no responsibility for what I had to do because he was automatically, you know, the, what everyone, everyone would blame it on him. You know, all my family Mm -hmm. and everyone would just blame it on him because that's how he's been. Right. 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 So I changed it from, it went from like a covering anger from a covering to a shield and to a sword. And I think a lot of men do this without even realizing it is that anger comes usually in a protective way and then it ends up in a way where it destroys people especially the man who's angry right and i I love when you said that so it's from a a shield a tree to a shield to a sword because a shield can be both a shield to protect yourself and others but it can also be a weapon yeah that's really good that's very insightful yeah yeah when you have a, a shield and a sword you have two weapons really yeah and so um, that's what I kind of correlated with is that, that kind of progression of what it was. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I'm 15 years old. I don't have any healthy relationship with a man in my life. Mm-hmm. And, and the one man that I did have a good relationship with was my cousin. He was an older guy, but, and, you know, he, I don't know, he, some people just have like this comfort about them, right? Or you're just around right. them. And right. even if like yeah. he was a rugged guy, like he was a real country, like logger, rugged guy, mm-hmm. but he was really comforting. You know, he was, he just had a piece to him when I was around him where I was just like, I knew I didn't have to have my walls up. He was the mm-hmm. only, the only guy. Yeah. And, you know, the only safe person, safe person. Exactly. And he didn't yeah. even know that he was my safe person. Wow. He, didn't even, he didn't even know that because I, I, right. I didn't know how to communicate. I didn't know how to talk to people, right? Being vulnerable wasn't a thing in my life, you know? Yeah. And once I really started to kind of like him, we started hanging out a lot more. I would call him and ask him like, hey, you know, could I come over and hang out at your house? You know, disaster struck and he was he was murdered. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, he was murdered by his his ex-girlfriend you know when he went over to see his newborn baby wow and uh yeah they they executed him and that was for me at that time i kind of started volunteering on the fire department as like one of the um explorers you know where they have like a thing where you can like go to calls and stuff and they actually didn't know that this call was like a a a murder you know kind of thing so i got on the truck and i i showed up and I remember walking in and I saw him and I was just like, whoa, you know, I saw, I don't know how graphic I can get on here, but you know, his, his head was blown up. They shot him in the back of the head. And I remember walking in and seeing him on the ground. And to this day, it's just like that image is seared into my head. And it's just like, yeah, at that time at 15, right at 15, I see someone that, 
that's like that. And, and you're only safe person. Yeah. On top of it and all. so it you're just destroyed me. It just destroyed me. Absolutely yeah. destroyed me. Yeah. And you know, even my family don't even know that, you know, because it's just weird at the time I didn't tell anybody anything because yeah. the, the less information that people know about me, the better. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, so at that time that happened and then my other safe person was my grandmother. My grandma, my grandma was an amazing woman. Very gentle, kind, loving, caring woman. And, you know, she wasn't taken from us per se, but right when I started, because I transferred from him to her, and I kind of, you know, without telling people, I would just kind of find a safe person where I would try to spend a little bit of time with her. Right, right. And without being too vulnerable, you know what I mean? Right, 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 right. And so she has, she's 100% healthy. She's, you know, I think 65 at the time playing softball like competitive softball like she was oh my super, gosh <laughs> yeah super healthy at, wow. you know, athletic person and right. out of nowhere she has a massive stroke and she dies wow right? and so it's like at this point i'm just like wow like everybody that i care about is dying wow everybody that i trust trust is starting to starting to die hmm. and then i heard someone say oh well bad things happen in threes you know what I mean? So I'm like, yeah. okay, well, that's not good because I was sexually assaulted. I was raised by a father that was not very healthy or good to me or my family. And my cousin was murdered. I guess this is a start of another three, right? Mm. And so like people, they're trying to tell me that to help me, but then I'm just like, oh man, like my whole life's just going to be a set of threes. Wow. And so you know, I'm angry at this time. I started doing drugs, you know, when I was 12, 13 and just to cope with my life, you know, and just to cope with what it was. Cause I was like, man, if this is life, like I didn't get away from this, Yeah, yeah. you know? So like it started with, with drugs and, and I'm 15 years old, barely passing classes in school, like barely showing up. And whenever I did show up, I would, you know, get kicked out because I was, not very respectful or or anything, but it's like, I didn't know any different, you know? And I hated it because I was getting, my home life was terrible. So it was like, I could take it out on other people. You know, I was a bully. I treated kids terribly. And, and I remember my sister, Chelsea, she just had a, a newborn baby, 18 months. She came and she stayed with us at at my parents' house. And this is when my dad started getting healthy. So, mm. you know, she trusted him enough to come back and, and she was a really forgiving, loving person. And so 18 months, she's staying at her house. Me and her got really close. Cause the guy that she had a baby with, he was, he disappeared and had three babies with three different people. And so it was a disaster. And so like that summer I went and stayed with her and helped her out with, with uh, her daughter and, we got really close, you know, when you're, when you're spending that much time together and you're helping take care of a child, you get pretty close. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And, you know, I kind of opened up to her about the sexual assault that I went through. She didn't even know it at the time, you know, and, mm-hmm. and, you know, we just, she was always there, right? After this, she was mm-hmm. always there. She would always show up, you know, my athletic events, she would show up my birthday, she would show up and yeah, that's cool. Like she's just, yeah, she was great. And, but I'm still struggling with this anger thing, you know? And Mm -hmm. so she comes and she stays at my parents' house and she calls me up one night, uh, the week before she had finals to graduate from OSU, um, with her pre-med because she wanted to be a neurosurgeon. She did it in three years with a child. She was super intelligent, super smart. And she was dedicated as all get out, you know, she was a college athlete did all this anyway. So she, she uh, calls me and she's like, Hey, could you, could you take my daughter on a walk? You know, and just give me some time to, to study before I have to leave. And I was like, yeah, yeah, I could do that. And so I went and picked up her daughter and I took her on a walk. And, and once I, you know, it's about a 40 minute walk kind of, there's this walk that we usually do around my neighborhood. And, mm-hmm. and I was like, Oh, you know, there's a dairy queen that my cousin owned like about, 
couple blocks down the road and I was like, Oh, I'm just going to take her dairy queen. I'll get her a little torch cone, a little you know, baby cone. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And I'll take her back to give Chelsea a little bit more time. And, and, you know, I left my phone, so I didn't tell her. And so I remember walking back into the driveway and my sister was out there just upset. You know, she's like, where have you been? I'm like, Oh, I just took Ziza down to get some ice cream. She's like, you didn't even ask, like, you didn't even tell me. You know, and mm-hmm. and to me, that's such a small deal. You know what I mean? But now, right. as a father, I'm like, oh, like I would want to know where my yeah. my yeah. kid is at. You know what I mean? And so at the time, I was just like, had a terrible attitude, and I was just like, you know, like cussed her out, and was like, had this huge argument. So something that was so small, I made so big because I just didn't want to feel the shame of doing something wrong. You know, when I say wrong, oh, it's yeah. like, yeah. Yeah. Like I was, I was just so defensive at the time that it was just like, whenever anybody came against me, I was just like, nope, I'm going to go to 100 and I guarantee you, I'm going to make you feel worse than you make me feel. Right. Yeah. 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 And so, uh, you know, go ahead. Do you have something? No, I was thinking that that, that's a lot of men that I see in the culture. Yeah. And it you is. Know, and sometimes we misread what's going on. Yeah. You know, we could exactly. just take it at face value and not hear the backstory on what got them there yep and uh yeah it's it's 100 percent correct um anyway so you know the last things i said to her was like i hate you you're an f and b word and i hope you die like i told her that i hope you die okay Mm. i go up to my room and i fall asleep and I had a big heart, even through all this, I had a big heart. I just didn't show it to anybody. So I was awake all night. Like, like, man, I wish I could apologize to her. Like, I wish I could just make this better. But my, Mm -hmm. my shame and my ego told me like, no, no, she'll come to you. Like she'll come to you and and she can make this better because this is her fault. Mm -hmm. And, you know, whether some of that was Satan at the time, you know, I don't like giving power to Satan because, you know, he's below me now, but you know, he, he does stuff like that. Right. It's like, he, he, he gets people seeds, alone yeah. and yeah, and it's seeds and it's like, whether, you know, you get seeds and either you water them or you don't. And at that time yeah. I was really good at watering seeds. I didn't care mm-hmm. where it came from. I just watered seeds. Mm. And so she came up and she knocked on my door the, the next morning. She's like, Hey Trevor, I know you're awake. Like, I'm sorry. I Can you open your door so I can talk to you? And I was so upset and I wanted to be so right that I didn't answer the door. Mm. I remember just laying there thinking like, nah, she can wait. And she's like, knocked again. She's like, Trevor, I love you. I'm headed out for the weekend. You know, I'll see you. See you on Monday. And I'm like, man, it didn't matter how badly I wanted to say bye to her. Mm -hmm. The shame and the guilt and the frustration took took over, right? It it Mm -hmm. completely didn't matter what I wanted. I wasn't even protecting myself. I wasn't protecting my own emotions even because I didn't trust myself. Right. Right. And so she like leaves. I remember hearing her downstairs because my room was over our carport garage area. And I remember her, my parents just got back home and she's like, Hey, like, could you tell Trevor to call me? Like, I would, I would really love to talk to him. Like we had a big fight yesterday and I just, I don't feel right about it. And so I heard that as well. And I remember I got up and I walked downstairs and my mom goes, Hey, Trevor, Chelsea wants you to call her. You should call her. And I said, nah, she's dead to me. Mm. And they're like, and my mom tried to say something, but I ignored her. I was just like, nah, like that's not happening. You know? And I was mm-hmm. so, so, cause I was just, I was so offensive and like, I got offended so easily by people that I was just like, if yeah. they don't want me in their life, I don't want them in, our, in my life. You know what I mean? And even if they did. Yeah. yeah. And it's like, even if they did want me, it's like, I didn't want them because I didn't want to get close to them. Right. I didn't, I didn't yeah. want them to yeah. see me, see how really vulnerable I was, mm-hmm. how alone mm-hmm. I was, you know? And so that was a, a Thursday, Friday. She called me Saturday. She called me Sunday. She called me and Sunday she left me a message and she was like hey like I'm so excited I'm uh, on my way to pick up James James was her boyfriend at the time mm-hmm. and he was firefighting and he just got back in town and he goes she goes I'm go- headed to pick him up and I got a flat tire and I changed it all by myself like she was so happy that she could change the tire by herself you know what I mean uh-huh. and she's like and she was like a girly girl like she was gorgeous absolutely beautiful 
And so she's like, yeah, I was in a dress and I changed my own tire. I'm excited. And she like left me this whole message. And she's like, I love you. I'll see you tomorrow. Like, I'm really excited to, to talk to you. Mm-hmm. And I remember getting that and I almost called it back. And I was like, no, no, I'll wait. You know, we can wait till tomorrow. She'll be here. And, you know, at the time I was driving back from Eugene uh, Eugene's this town up north of my town that I lived in at the time. And I remember these two state troopers just blowing by me about 110, just flying by me. And I remember my heart sunk. And at the time, I didn't know that I was discerning the fact that something happened in my family, right? Oh, uh, yeah. And because I didn't know about all this discernment and all these different gifts and stuff. And I remember looking at my sister, Felicia, and I go, something bad happened to our family just now. And my sister's mm-hmm. like, what? Like, whatever, dude. Like, no, like everything's good. So I remember I drove home and and you come into my town and we lived on this straight stretch, really long straight stretch. And I remember driving down and I told, looked over to Felicia and I was like, hey, those cops are sitting in front of our house. And she's like, oh, that's weird. And... So I pulled up and I got out and this cop walked up to me and he goes, Hey, are you Trevor? And I was like, yeah. And he's like, I, uh, I got something to tell you. And I was like, like, Oh man, am I busted? You know, I was selling drugs at the time. <laughs> I was like, that's literally the first thing that came to my mind. I was like, Oh man, uh, like, I'm about to get thrown in jail. <laughs> and he's like, um, you know what? How about, how about you go talk to your aunt? And my aunt was there and she was sobbing. And I remember I walked around into my driveway and I saw my mom in the fetal position on the ground. Mm. And uh, she was saying, oh God, oh God, why? And I, my aunt hugged me and everything was so surreal. Like I remember even, even today I look back on it and I'm just like, it's not even real. Mm-hmm. And my aunt goes, Trevor, your sister was killed in a car accident this morning. Mm. And uh, sorry, I still get emotional, but no, go for it. I always say that tears are pain leaving the body. You know, mm-hmm. Jesus dealt with my trauma, but I, but he left me the pain, which is a good thing, I think. Anyway, but so I remember walking by my mom and her seeing that, and it was like she was just there, you know, like her, like her soul wasn't there anymore. And to say the least, this is the second kid that they lost to a car accident. So oh, wow. my brother was killed. My first, my parents' first son was killed in a, a car accident. A drunk driver hit him and my mom. And uh, he was dead on impact. And my mom actually almost died about eight times on the surgery table, it ripped her in half. Wow. And uh, so she had to be put back together. Anyway, I remember walking back and, and up to this point, I never saw my dad have any other emotion besides happy or angry. Mm-hmm. and I could hear like this kind of deep roar and I walked through my garage and onto my back porch and I looked to the left and it was my parents had these three two sliding glass doors that looked right into their bedroom and I looked in there and I saw my dad on the end of the bed leaned over and he's just bawling first time I ever mm-hmm. saw my dad cry mm-hmm. first time I ever seen a tear run down his face Wow! and he was saying God why why us why me Mm-hmm. And for me, it like broke my soul because I was just like, who is this God that my dad, somebody that I've never ha- seen to have emotion or be afraid of anything, mm-hmm. who is this God where he's begging and pleading? Like, why? You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, yeah it just yeah. kind of, it broke me for a second. And we grew up Christian. You know, we went to church like a little small church that my great great grandparents right. built, but it was, you know, real religion, you know? And it was like, up to this point, my religion was my parents' religion, really. Like I didn't believe right. in this. I didn't believe right. in anything that was going on. I remember I sat down and I picked up my phone and I called my sister, Chelsea. I went to mm-hmm. voicemail and I left her a message. And to this point, it didn't hit me. Right. Cause I was like, man, what's going on? And I left her a message. And I was just like, you know, I love you. I can't wait to see you. Blah, blah, blah. I was in shock. Mm -hmm. And then I felt these hands on my shoulders and I heard an audible voice say, everything's going to be okay. And it was the most peace I've ever had in my life. Wow. 
And one of the worst parts of my life, I had the most peace because somebody or something came and touched me and told me it was going to be okay. Wow. Right. And to make a long story short, you know, after that, I struggled with suicide. I was tormented. Um, Things would show up in my room at night and they would recite the exact words that I told to my sister to me. Mm -hmm. And then it actually, you know, I would call it a demon or a spirit. Yeah. And it actually, he became a friend of mine where I could talk to him and I had conversations with him at the, you know, this, I would sit on my bed and I have conversations with him and he would, you know, talk about how, you know, I did this to her and how I just need to take care of it and this and that. And, and, you know, put suicide in my head. He, what he did is he really excluded me from everybody. Mm-hmm. I mean, he really pulled me away from everybody. I burned every bridge that I had. I didn't talk to anybody. I was awake all night, slept all day. And, and one day I was sitting at the end of my bed and had, you know, I was taking probably 15 to 20 oxys a day, just mm-hmm. being numb. I wanted to be numb. Yeah. And, you know, he told me, he said, you should take all of them. So I took 27, 27 oxycontins. Wow. I remember laying there dozing off, you know, nodding off. I don't know if you know anything about drug addiction or anything like that, but it's called nodding off, you know, when your you know, nervous system is like shutting down. And I remember mm-hmm. I nodded off and I woke up in this room of, you know, glorious room. And I had this encounter with what now I know to be my grandfather and my uncle that passed away before I ever met them. And, wow. and it was crazy because I just, they just told me stories about my, now I know my mother. They told me a story about this time where they were playing down in the barn and my grandfather heard this, his daughter scream. And he ran down there and she got stung by a bee and he's like, don't ever scream like that again if, unless you're getting eaten by a bear. They, you know, at the time they came over on the, you know, the Oregon Trail. So it's like where I lived, it's like country, it's straight yeah. wilderness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and so he's more frustrated at the fact that she screamed, you know, because it was like, oh, man, my heart dropped. Like, I thought you were getting mauled by yeah. a bear or something. Yeah, yeah. And she called him Buzz. I mean, he called her Buzz. That was her nickname. And I never knew this, right? Yeah. And so they're like, they looked at me and they're like, all right, it's time for you to go back now. And I said, what do you mean it's time for me to go back now? And they said, God's not done with you there. It's time wow. for you to go back. You have an wow. assignment. And I was like, oh, wow. Like, I don't even know what that means, but I want to go with you. And they started walking off. And my uncle, he looked back and he said, oh, yeah, and it's not your fault. I said, what do you mean? I don't get what that means. He said, Chelsea's death. It's not your fault. Mm-hmm. You had nothing to do with it. Mm-hmm. And so what that did is that took that shame and that that thing that this, this being, you know, the spirit had on me. Cause I thought it was my fault. I thought I spoke that into reality. Oh yeah. yeah, yeah you yeah. know what I mean? Cause I was literally the last words I ever told her was I hope yeah. to die. Wow. You know what I mean? So it was just yeah. like, that was the yeah. one thing that just ate me alive. Right. And so they walked off and I woke up at the end of my bed and I had throw up and stuff on, you know, sweat on my, on my shirt. And I could count all the oxys there. Somehow I threw them up. I don't know. Wow. And uh, I remember I stood up and it was the sun was rising. And I looked in the mirror and I said, God, I don't know if I believe in you, but at least I know you're real. Mm. I was angry at the time at God. Mm-hmm. Because how could he do this to his son, right? How could he do this to somebody that everyone says he loved? Right. But my life has been a, a disaster. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so I went through this and I still struggled with a lot of things. I struggled with drug addiction up until I was 20. And I was living in, in a big city north of my town. And, you know, I was living the life, got affiliated at one point. You know, I was selling a lot of drugs and stuff. And I just wasn't living a godly life at all, which was right. fine, you know, because I, I told God, like, I didn't. I don't think you're a good God, you know? Mm -hmm. And 
so anyway, I was, you know, homeless for a while for about six months. I was homeless. I was living in this little beater car that I had. And, but it was just at the time it was okay. Cause I didn't have anything, anybody I could be on my own. Right. Like, like I burned, I literally burned all the bridges I had on purpose because I was ashamed of who I became. Mm-hmm. Right. So, mm-hmm. so this is where I was alone, completely alone. And my mom, right. my mom was my savior, right? not my savior, but she was the one person that showed me the true love of Jesus at the time. Mm. It didn't matter what I did. She, she kept really good boundaries. Don't get me wrong. She kept really good boundaries, but it didn't, it didn't matter what I did. She always kept in touch. Oh, that's good. Whether it was, whether it was just leaving me a message, she would call me. I wouldn't answer because I was ashamed of who I was. I was ashamed that my mother, somebody that I love so dearly, would have to see me like this, would have to mm-hmm. hear me like this. So I didn't answer, but she always left a message and she always said, son, I don't, I don't know where you are or what you're doing, but I love you. Um, and I, I will always love you. And what wow. that did is it gave me permission to be messy, it gave me permission to be where I was. Mm-hmm. And she didn't force me into anything. She didn't, you know, take anything from me. She didn't want anything from me. She wanted to give love to me. Mm-hmm. And so many times when I felt alone, I listened to that message, and that's it saved me. It really did. Wow. It kept me. It kept me going. And so anyway, you know, I had a, a crazy encounter. I was in Northeast Portland, and someone came up to me, and he's like, "Hey, are you Trevor?" I was in a Taco Bell, Northeast Portland, <laughs> Taco, Taco Bell. Bell. And I'm like on my third day of, of being awake. And he's like, hey, are you Trevor? And at the time, what I was doing, I was like, oh, man, I don't got my nine on me right now. Like, you know, big dude in Northeast Portland walking up to me, knowing me my name. Like, that's not going to be a good thing. So I was like, yeah, yeah, what's up? And he's like, hey, God told me to come talk to you. Wow. I'm like, no, we didn't. He didn't, tell, he didn't tell you to come talk to me. And he's like, yeah, yeah. He told me to come talk to you. And he said, you need to be I'm putting on a, a, a conference up on the hill later this week. And I need you to be there. Mm. And I was like, nope, I ain't going to be there. That's not <laughs> that's not for me. And so I, I remember I grabbed my food and I walked out. That was like a Wednesday. Walked out, got my car. At this time, I had a little apartment. In downtown Portland, I drove to it and I fell asleep. You know, fell asleep, woke up mid Friday morning, and uh, you know, did my thing, got high, drove around, and I would text people. You know, trying to set up times where I could sell some stuff, and and I would just drive because I love driving because I could. That's just a time I could be alone. Driving's always, you know, kind of ease my mind because I could like right. think but not overthink. Right. Like it was right. just like a passive thing. Like a and so I drove, thing. yeah. And I drove by, you know, there's like this lookout up on top of this hill, like in East Portland. At this time, I f- completely forgot that this dude even talked to me. Oh, yeah. And so I'm like driving up, trying to find my <laughs> way up to the top of this hill. And I drive by this big dome and, it, and I can hear like a bass, like, boo, boo, boo. And I'm like, oh, man, that's kind of cool. Maybe it's a concert. Like I love music at the time. So I like pulled up in there, got out, went in to try to see uh, if I could get in. They're like, oh, no, this is a, a closed uh, conference. Like you have to have pre-order tickets. And I'm like, oh, OK. You know, and I go to walk out and I'm like walking back to my car and I hear these footsteps behind me. And again, you know, I was in such a, a place of fight or flight that I was like, oh, man, do I run? Do I turn around? Like another yeah. first inclination of me is like, oh, man, where's my pistol at? Like yeah. there's someone coming up on me right now, you know, cause right. I lived in that right. lifestyle. Like I didn't well, know when street. I was going to live yeah. or die. Right. Like I was living yeah. the streets. That's I was the living street. the life. Yeah. 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 And so I remember turning around and there was this like kind of, you know, gentle guy. He walks up to me and goes, Hey man, I heard you in there. Uh, I have a ticket for you. And I was like, what do you mean you have a ticket for me? And he goes, well, my wife wasn't able to come and, uh, God still told me to show up and give someone this, this ticket. And I'm like, okay. And so God's like working this out, right? And I'm not even following God at this time, but he he loves me so dearly 
And so somebody, yeah. somebody must have been praying for me. Somebody that God really loves must have been praying for me good, right? Yeah. <laughs> and so we lined all this out. And I remember I walked in and my heart kind of dropped because I was like, right before I opened these doors, there's like, you know, six or seven big double wide doors that you'd walk mm-hmm. into. And at the time, I didn't know it was on the other side. I could just hear music. And I was like, man, this is kind of crazy. Right? And it was very peaceful and very calm. And I was just like, man, I don't know what's going on here. Like, it was just not my normal. Yeah. Yeah. And so I go and I open this door and I look in and there's just, there's 6,000, if I had to guess, 6,000 young adults worshiping. Wow. Right? And they're wow. singing, set a fire down in my soul that I can't uh, contain, that song. I can't control. Right. Good, so it's yeah. a great song. Sorry if whoever hears that, I'm, I'm a terrible singer, but um, <laughs> so I walk in and I sit on this, on this uh, like chair right to the right. You know, give me give me a way out. You know, if anything gets oh, too crazy, true, yeah. I can just leave, yeah. right? Yeah. So I sit there and I'm just sitting there, and I swear it was an hour where they sang this chorus for an hour. <laughs> I'm like, these people must know somebody that I don't know because I wouldn't stand here for an hour worshiping <laughs> some guy that I've never met. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so at this time, I'm like, I'm I'm about to leave, and I'm just like, God, if you want me to serve you a day of my life, like you need to show up now. Like without without a, a doubt in my head, I need to know you're real. And I wouldn't tell everybody to give God an ultimatum like that because I'm just like, you know, I don't know. I don't know about that. But I, I believe that he loves us so much that when he can see that our heart's ready for something, mm-hmm. he'll show up, right? Yeah. And so I go to step in the aisle. You know, I waited there a few minutes. I didn't feel anything. I went to step in the aisle. I fall straight on my face. And I remember feeling the wow. most peace and comfort I ever had in my life. And what I would explain to be pure love. Wow. And I remember hearing this voice and he said, everything's going to be okay because you are my beloved son. And so what that did for me at the time was it correlated the time that I had the experience that I had when Chelsea, I found out Chelsea was killed. Mm -hmm. correlated that experience with this experience to know that that piece that I had then is this piece that I had now. Oh, interesting. And then the second thing it did is it gave me identity to something that I never knew I had identity in. Mm -hmm. I was, I was loved by a father and I was a Mm -hmm. son that he loved. Wow. Right. Because I was estranged from my father this time, you know, bad relationship. Right. 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 So it, it gave me identity, which I was missing. And it mm-hmm. correlated the two peaceful times in my life together to wow. be correlated with him, right? That's awesome. Sorry if this is taken. I don't know how much. Yeah, <laughs> it's all good. It's all, it's, but, it's just so good. Anyway, so I get encountered at this story, point. You know? Yeah, I get encountered at this point. You know, it takes me a little time to, to really get into the vibe of who Jesus is, the God of who Jesus is. And not me. I get to a point where I'm just like, I don't want anything anymore. I don't want drugs. I don't want women. I don't want nothing. Two weeks later, I meet my wife. And uh, <laughs> yeah, I got a pretty crazy story. But yeah, so that's kind of, I guess, where my wilderness season kind of started to come out. Where I kind of. What would, what would you tell other people that are in a wilderness season to encourage them? Um, I would say don't let your shame keep you somewhere. There's people out there that, that love you, that want to help you, but a lot of times shame or maybe the messiness of your life, like you're allowed to be messy. You know, sometimes there's times where you got to just get up and do things and just go with it, you know, go with the flow, do your life because you got to continue life. But I think there's a big thing where people are afraid of messy, right? God's not Mm -hmm. afraid of messy. Yeah. So find somebody that knows the true love of who God is and say, hey, I need help. Right. Don't be don't don't be afraid to ask for help. Don't let the shame of maybe what you've been through or what you're doing or what's going on prevent you from asking for help. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, Yeah. It's that's one thing that I wish I knew is that I'm allowed to go and ask somebody for help. I'm allowed to I'm not defined by what I've been through or what I've done, Mm -hmm. that there is somebody out there that loves you enough to say, hey, I'm going to help you through this. You know what I mean? So. Yeah, totally. What about, what about those that are struggling with anger? 
because you had some really golden nuggets in that. What would you yeah. tell somebody that's really going through it and really struggling with anger? I would say the there's always trauma that's correlated with anger, right? And a lot of times men use anger when they're afraid, when they're afraid mm -hmm. of something, when they're when they feel out of control, when they feel inadequate, when they feel like they're not meeting an expectation. A lot of times anger comes out because they don't know how to be vulnerable enough to say, hey, I'm afraid that I'm not enough for you, or I'm afraid that I can't protect you, or I'm afraid of, of this and that, right? Mm -hmm. And so I would say when you first feel anger coming on, you got to take a second and realize what am I afraid of now? Or what, what is the emotion, the underlying emotion of anger? Because anger is, I don't think anger is really like a primary emotion usually. No, they talk about it as a secondary emotion. Yeah. Like so underneath the anger. So there's always something there. And what I've mm -hmm. come to today, you know, I still get angry sometimes. Don't get me wrong. I'm not perfect. Right. Yeah. But I'm really anymore. good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm really good at stopping, taking a second and saying, Okay, what am I feeling here? Am I feeling rejected? Mm -hmm. Am I feeling fearful that I can't protect somebody? Mm -hmm. Am I, you know, what am I feeling? That's so really it, it's got to get to a point, and that what that comes from is identity, right? That comes mm -hmm. from identity. I had to go through a whole journey where I figured out my identity as a son to a loving father, mm -hmm. and. And when you have identity, then you can realize, oh, I do have emotion. I do have things. I'm allowed to not be perfect. I'm allowed to, you take a lot of the responsibility off yourself to be all these things and you put it on God and you say, I'm allowed to not have to do all these things all at once. Right. Right. So That's so good. Yeah. So Trevor, I would love for you to pray for people right now that have gone through what I call complex trauma. Yeah. Because I feel like that's what you've been through. Um, and will you lift up those people that are in the wilderness? Yeah, definitely. Okay. Holy Spirit, thank you for, for being an active living God. Thank you for being intimate in our life. Thank you for wanting to know our hearts. Thank you for being with us in every moment. In, in the wilderness season, out of the wilderness season and everything. Thank you for giving us hope. I pray that anybody that's listening to this to this podcast or any other podcast that has dealt with with multiple traumas or multiple things where they just feel like they're in a wilderness season and they don't they don't see a way out that you show yourself that your light shines beyond all darkness and give them the experience that you gave me the perspective where it's always about perspective where you're at's always about perspective that your path leads us through the deepest darkness that that it's okay because you are there and there there is a, a meadow to rest in and there is the living water near us at all times it doesn't matter where we are we have everything we need with you god that you are enough give them the peace and give them the strength to continue on to move forward to to be full to be fulfilled Thank you that everything that they're they're going through right now, that there is somebody that loves them, that you love them, yes, Jesus. that you give them everything they need. I pray for just overwhelming comfort, comfort on their hearts and their minds, give them peace in their inner soul. In Jesus' almighty name. Amen. Thank you so much, Trevor. I appreciate you being on the show. And I really feel like God has put on my heart to take it an, a step further and to help people that are in the wilderness. So we are in the process right now of creating a program and it's going to be called the Wilderness Warrior Program, uh, pack provision and prayer for the journey out. So if that's something you're interested in, we are in the developmental stage right now. I want to develop it for the needs. Like I'm, I'm thinking about what do you need? Um, so in the comments below, or if you want to email us at info at squaretreepublishing.com, go ahead and do that. And just tell us what you need as we develop this program out. 
let us know if you're interested in this to find out more information when it does come out. And we're thinking about ways to fully support um, if you're in that wilderness season and, and to it's multifaceted, um, the program, so that it'll be different things to help you and support you through this journey out. So thank you, Trevor, so much for being on the show today. I really appreciate your vulnerability and um, the strength that you carry. You yeah, carry you. A strength. And so thank you for being on the show today. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you for allowing me to be here. Um, if you don't mind, I would love to give my email out to people. So okay. If they want to connect with me, then they can Absolutely. reach out. Absolutely. Um, but it's True Heart Discovered. So T-R-U-E-H-E-A-R-T discovered at gmail.com. Um, and that's my... And that's discovered with an E-D at the end. Yeah, with an E-D okay. at the end. That is we'll correct. put it in the comments on Facebook as well. Yep. And so... Yeah, I love each and every one of you guys. I love you, Sherry. You're awesome. I love your family. You guys are great. You guys um, are awesome too. So Yeah, thank you so much for allowing me to be here. Well, thank you guys. Until next time, we'll see you on the Wilderness Season Podcast. Bye. Bye. Hey guys, it's Sherry Ward here with a really quick announcement. I am so excited that my next book, Crossing the Jordan, Navigating Life's Transition and Changes is coming out soon. It's in the final editing stage. It'll be the second book in the trilogy. So the first one is The Wilderness Season. And then we've got this crossing over season. And it is an actual season. Nobody talks about it. It's the tail end of the wilderness and what happens right before you come out of the wilderness and go into your promised land. So stay tuned. We would love to have you on the Zoom call for our book launch coming up soon. All right, until next time, see you later. Thank you for listening to the Wilderness Season podcast. If you need help navigating through your own wilderness season, pick up a copy of my book, A Journey Out of the Wilderness, available on Amazon. Also, continue the conversation online with us by going to our Wilderness Season Facebook page. For resources and events, you can go to www.SherryLynnWard.com. If you have enjoyed this show, please subscribe and review our podcast. Just remember, you're not alone.